Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of the Grain Talk webinar series. Today we have Joanna Folling from OMAFRA today talking about managing the 2020 winter wheat crop. Joanna, I'm going to ask you to do a little bit of an introduction about yourself and what you do and then I'll let you get into your presentation. All right, great. Thanks for having me today. So as was mentioned, my name is Joanna Fallings and I am the cereal specialist with OMAFRA. And today I just wanted to touch base with everyone about the 2020 winter wheat crop as the wheels have started turning and we're already starting to get work happening in the fields. Um, and so just to start us off, I uh, just wanted to reflect back a little bit on the fall planting conditions and, and how that's impacting where we are at now. So for the most part, uh, the winter wheat crop went into excellent conditions. It was seeded in uh, mid to late September for a significant portion of the province with the remaining wheat planted into uh, early to mid October. Uh, this particular field here on your screen was a, from a field that was planted in late September and the photo was taken at the end of October. And so as you can see, that crop got a good start to the season, uh, had a good root system developed and, and was ready uh, going into winter. Um, but as I mentioned there, you know, planting date has played a significant role in where we are in the crop in terms of staging and how we're going to manage it going forward. And so this was from a field again last fall, this was in North Huron, and this was actually a photo taken in the same field. And you can see that just 10 days difference between these two planting dates. So the, the hand on the left was the wheat that was seeded October 10th and the hand on the right is the wheat that was seeded on October 30th. And you can see there's, you know, this wheat on the left has a one leaf stage, whereas the wheat on the right, um, we do have two to three leaves in some instances in the field. And so that has carried through to spring and is definitely going to influence how we manage the crop. So if you haven't done so already, I know there are many who have, but if you haven't done so already, I would encourage you to get out and scout your fields and, and start making these stand assessments and um, get a handle on where your wheat crop is at so that you can make the best management decisions this spring. So when we're getting out to our fields, we want to be making our stand assessments. Uh, we want to be walking multiple parts of the field, so don't just go into the worst part or to the best part. Make sure you're walking the full field and getting a handle on the entire stand. And you want to be counting the number of plants per foot of row, and you also want to be counting or looking at the overall health uh, of the crop and the distribution of those plants. So when you're out doing your counts, um, I know this is a bit older data. This is the, the most current data that we do have, but 20 plants per foot of row is, is what we're looking for, and that is gives you your 100% of your yield potential. Um, again, you want to be making sure that those plants are evenly distributed, they're healthy, especially as we start to get down to lower plant stand counts. If those plants aren't healthy and evenly distributed, you might need to start making decisions around whether or not to keep that stand. If you planted at say 1.6 million seeds per acre that fall, last fall, that translates to about 23 plants per foot of row. And if you seeded upwards of 1.8 to 2 million seeds per acre, that gives you 26 to 29 plants per row. Just to give you an idea of what you should be looking for when you're out in the fields. But as I mentioned, the actual stand count is, is important, but also the health of the crop is important. So if you come across plants like this, where you know that seed is sitting on the soil surface, it's holding on by a hair, don't consider those plants into your count because they may not survive, especially if you are still on heavy clay soils where heaving might still be happening a little bit, um, those plants might get heaved right out of the ground. Um, so, we, so we want to avoid keeping those in our counts. For the most part, the winter wheat crop came out of winter in, in pretty good shape. Uh, we've got nice even stands, but there are some trouble fields. And so some of those growers are reporting losses of up to 30% in some cases. And the trouble areas tends to be on heavy clay soils, especially later planted wheat, where we've, we're starting to see a quite a bit of heaving. Uh, so counties like Lambton, parts of the Niagara region, so Haldeman, uh, parts of East Brant, we are seeing some heavy 
uh, or heaving, sorry, on some of those heavy clay soils. So just keep an eye out for those areas. We do have fields that have experienced ponding. So we've got some poor drainage and we've got that water staining there. And so some of those patches might be coming through. And then we've also had some instances where we did have some ice coverage over the winter. So up in, in the Bruce Peninsula and into Gray counties, we did see some ice cover there. But again, for the most part, the winter wheat crop did come out of winter in, in pretty good shape. And so you've, you've probably seen me uh, show this particular map a number of times throughout the winter months. Um, and I, I just, again, wanted to emphasize that for, for most of the province, we still should be seeding uh, our winter wheat or targeting to seed our winter wheat in that mid to late September time frame. As we move further north, you know, that becomes early September and, and New Liskert, for example, that's even into late August. We want to get that wheat in the ground and really only in the most southern part of the province in Essex, Chatham and Kent. Those are the regions where we can plant into October, um, but for the most part, we do want to get that wheat planted in September because it really comes down to the amount of growing degree days that we get to get that crop growing and prepared going into winter. And so what? where are we with growing degree days? Uh, what's the impact in terms of the stage and growth of the crop? Well, this, this chart here I put together using information from weathercentral.ca, which, which anyone I believe can go on to. And this just highlights the growing degree accumulations up to this past Saturday, so up to April 4th. And as you can see, for those fields that were planted in you know, later September, so September 30th in, in say Essex County, we have almost 900 growing degree days, which which is going to be extremely important in terms of where the stage uh, or in terms of the growth of the crop. But if you look at October 21st, you know, we're only at about 450 growing degree days. So just because you're in Essex County doesn't mean you're all at the same stage. It really is going to, uh, your planting date really is going to impact where that crop is at. Similarly, in other counties, for example, if we look at Huron, you know, that early plant wheat got about 650 growing degree days. Uh, compared to just over 300 if it was planted in late October. So as you can see, there's quite the range uh, depending on, on when the crop was planted and where, where you are. What this has translated to is, you know, that early planted wheat, so anything pretty much prior to September 23rd has eight plus tillers per plant. Uh, the later September stuff has, you know, three to five tillers as we get into that early October, we're at that one to two tillers. And as we get to that late October range, depending again on where you are in the province, but um, we're at that, you know, barely emerged to up to three leaf stage. And so this is really gonna play a role in our nitrogen management, which we're gonna talk about next. So when you are making your decisions around nitrogen management, there's a couple of things that, that we need to keep in mind. So one of them is that our maximum head size is determined at growth stage 30. So we need to make sure not only is there enough moisture at that stage, that our temperatures aren't too hot, um, but we just need to make sure that there's enough nitrogen there at that growth stage so that when that terminal spikelet is, is developed, um, you know, we, we're maximizing our head site because once that spike, the, the terminated <laughs> termination spikelet is developed that head will start to move up the stem of the wheat crop um, and of course what's the health of our crop this is also going to impact um, how we approach our nitrogen management strategies both from a health standpoint but also from a growth stage standpoint so we do get the question uh, quite a bit, you know, uh, growers tossing about whether or not to go with single or split applications. And so with single applications, we know that they're convenient. Uh, we have lower application costs because we only have to do one trip across the field. And we know that we can get excellent yields from a single application um, in our winter wheat crop. However, split applications, might be something to consider, especially if you have a late planted crop that we need to say induce tillers, um, or if it, more importantly, if you're a hard red wheat grower, split applications are absolutely necessary to help you get to the protein levels that you need to get to. So 
I'm going to give a couple of examples of some scenarios that were are out there this year um, to help you. Hopefully you can hopefully relate a little bit too. But if you have a field, you know, that looks like this, um, we don't have a lot of tillers. We have some pretty good growth happening, but we don't have a lot of tillers. In those fields, we want to be targeting 60% of our nitrogen at green up. So if you're a producer who is targeting 120 units of N, that might equate to 48 or 72 pounds of nitrogen at, at, at green up with the remaining 48% at first to second node or at growth stage 32, which usually happens around the first to second week of May, depending where you are. If you're a producer who likes to push a bit higher and say use 150 pounds of nitrogen, if that 60% would equate to 90 pounds at green up and the 40% would equate to 60 pounds at that first to second node. Now here's an example of a field that's in this sort of scenario this year. So this was winter wheat that was planted in Waterloo County on October 15th. Um, the crop was planted a little bit later than the producer was hoping. So they bumped up their seeding rates to 1.5 million seeds per acre. And as of March 19th, the crop was at a two to three leaf stage. So the nitrogen management approach for this particular field, the grower went in at the end of March, they put on 52 units of N and their 12 units of sulfur. And they do plan to come back with a split application around that growth stage 32. And so the reasoning behind this was because they weren't happy that they didn't have some tillers and wanted to get that crop off to a good start. They do plan to use a T3 fungicide for control of fusarium head blight and are going to continue to scout. And if those early season diseases that we need to be on the lookout for, like powdery mildew, stripe rust, or septoria, if those start to arise, they will apply those fungicides earlier on in the season um, as necessary. And so this was the walking the field uh, just on the 19th of March. We hadn't really started to green up yet. Um, and just a few days before this photo that was taken on March 31st, nitrogen was applied when they could reduce the amount of compaction um, and they weren't going to leave ruts in the field and they were able to get that nitrogen on that crop just to give it a bit of a boost early on. Now on the flip side, if you have a crop that has really excellent spring health, has lots of tillers, we want to adjust our splits a little bit differently. In this scenario, we want to be putting 40% of our nitrogen on at growth stage 25 to 30 rather than 60. So that would be 40% if you're putting 120 units of N down, that equates to 48 pounds of nitrogen. If you're putting 150 pounds, that equates to about 60 pounds of nitrogen. Then again, you want to come back at that growth stage 32, which is, you know, that first to second node, which tends to be around the beginning of May. Then you want to be coming in with the remaining uh, rates of nitrogen. If you're a producer, uh, you, are, you are happy with the growth of your crop. Um, you aren't as concerned with things like lodging. You don't have maybe a history of manure applications or you didn't follow a crop such as peas. A single application, as mentioned, is, is sufficient and will give you reasonable yields and it can be done so at the end of April. Again, just wanting to make sure that we have enough nitrogen there early on when our head size is being determined. Two examples of some fields in, in this sort of camp. Uh, this is a grower down in Brant County. So this photo uh, I just took there last week, last Wednesday, I believe it was. And this field was planted on September 24th at 1.6 million seeds per acre. And this grower had a quite a few tillers. He had six plus tillers. And so his plan for, for nitrogen management, um, they just because of logistics, they want to do a single nitrogen application. Uh, they, they want to manage lodging and don't plan to use a PGR. And so they're targeting 120 units of N for their total N. To, and they are also going to use a T3 fungicide application um, to help protect against Suzanne, but also with the research that was previously done with, with Dave Hooker and Peter um, showed that, that that fungicide and nitrogen, um, the synergistic benefits to having that. Again, this producer is going to continue to scout for early season diseases. So if things like powdery mildew, septoria and that come up, again, they will make those applications as needed. A slightly different scenario uh, is a grower in Middlesex County. So again, the growing degree day accumulations between Middlesex County 
and Brayden County are definitely different. And so that's why we might see a little bit more growth or a little bit further along in staging in Middlesex County. But this wheat was planted on September 20th. It did follow peas, so we have some nitrogen credit there. And this producer seeded at 1.6 million seeds per acre. And again, this crop was it was well above six plus tillers um, there last week. And so what this producer decided to do uh, at the end of March there, so the week prior to this, uh, he did apply his first uh, application of nitrogen. So he put on 72 pounds of nitrogen and plans to put his remaining nitrogen on at growth stage 32. But this grower is trying to push his wheat and he is going to use a plant growth regulator to help him manage his lodging so he can push those nitrogen rates a little bit higher, especially since he you know he's going in after a pea crop and will have a nitrogen credit there. He does plan to use a T3 fungicide. Um, and again, as we continue to scout in the season, if we do see those early season diseases emerge, uh, we'll make those applications as necessary. If you are a hard red wheat grower, so if you're, sorry, I should say this, if you're a soft red wheat grower, split applications are not necessary unless you're, you know, concerned about things like lodging um, and you want to push your nitrogen rates a little bit, uh, keep your nitrogen rates a little bit moderate. However, if you are a hard red wheat grower, split applications are absolutely necessary for making protein. They're not always necessary for making yield, but if you are trying to meet your protein requirements, split applications are necessary. From the work that was conducted at Black Creek Research Farm in uh, partnership with CNM Seeds and Yara, they did find that 150, 160 pounds of nitrogen, along with timely sulfur applications were necessary to make protein. They also found that a product called Amidus applied at flag leaf has shown consistent increases in both yield and protein. And so just to give you an idea of what that looked like, uh, this table here just shows the yield responses to different management regimes. Um, so the orange bar was, was 160 pounds of nitrogen along with sulfur all up front. So this was all applied at green up. The gray bars was a split scenario where we had 80 pounds of 28% and sulfur at green up and 80 pounds of 28% plus sulfur at flag leaf. And then the yellow bars is 80% of nitrogen plus eight pounds of sulfur at green up, followed by 80 pounds of, of nitrogen and sulfur using the amidus, sorry, at flag leaf. And so as you can see, uh, so in 2017, uh, the second treatment was not done. It was only done in 2018 and 2019. Um, but you know, there's a, a pretty significant or a respectable yield comparison uh, with the all up front compared to a split regime. And But where we do see an even greater response is between the, the amidus applied in the second application versus ATS at flag leaf. And one of the reasons we think there is a response difference here is because we are reducing the amount of injury or burn to that flag leaf. If you were at Cereal Smart this past winter, you will have heard Phil Needham say, we want to keep that flag leaf green and clean. And that's both from disease, but also from any damage to any of our other applications, such as 28%. So if you are a hard red wheat grower, you're trying to make protein, um, Amidus, you know, has shown both the yield benefits, but it's also shown the protein increases. And so again, we have the green, the orange bar with 160 and sulfur up front. Um, the gray bars are split nitrogen with 28% and the yellow bars is split nitrogen with um, Amidus in the second application. And so in 2017, uh, compared to all up front, the split with Amidus had a 1.7% uh, increase in protein. We only saw a 0.2% uh, increase in 2018 compared to a split with ATS or all up front. But very interestingly is that in 2019, uh, we saw a 1.8 bushel response uh, to that Amidus, Amidus product at the fly leaf compared to that ATS at fly leaf. Sulfur is something else that we also still need to keep in mind. It's not an issue every year in every field. Uh, so we do continue to do the work in this area in partnership with John Lozon at the University of Guelph. 
Uh, so for 2020, we are once again doing some small plot and on-farm trials wherever we can. If you're interested, please let us know. We're doing it in both corn, soybeans, and wheat. Um, but after two years of, of data, what we did find uh, was results very consistent with some of the work that was previously done, where we did see a response in two of the eight sites, or 25% of the time, with an average response of three bushels per acre uh, to that sulfur application. And so, as I said, this is pretty consistent with previous work. But what we are recommending uh, producers do is identifying those fields that are responsive on your farm. If you have fields that you have had a history of uh, sulfur deficiency, you've maybe seen it in other crops that you've had in that field, such as canola or forages, then those will be the fields that you want to target for your sulfur applications. Fields with low organic matter levels, no history of new applications might also be fields that you want to target. But I would encourage you to try and identify those fields um, and keep some strips so that you can determine whether or not they are in fact responsive. 10 pounds per acre still seems to be the most economic rate in terms of making an application and, and seeing a response. Uh, so 10 pounds per acre should be made um, as the minimum rate. However, if you are a hard red wheat grower, we are finding that as we are pushing ni higher nitrogen rates, we are also having to push down higher sulfur rates. Um, and so we might have to go upwards of 20 to 25 pounds in those scenarios. If you are splitting your nitrogen, it is suggested that you put the sulfur, at least 10 pounds of sulfur, in that first application to make sure there's adequate amounts of sulfur there for when that crop needs it. If you would like to come back in and top up with additional sulfur later on, again, especially if you're a hard red wheat grower, which is important in protein, then you can do so. But ensuring that there's at least 10 pounds in that first application um, is, is, is the recommendation. Now, I don't foresee this being as much of an issue this year as it was perhaps last year, um, but just a reminder, do not apply everything in one application. Make your priority on your nitrogen and sulfur applications. If you don't see any early season diseases, you can hold off on those fungicides, continue to scout, and as the disease, um, you know, if you're starting to see presence of disease, um, then those fungicide applications can be made. Um, but try to make them based on, you know, the need for the crop rather than say the herbicide timing or the nutrient timing. Um, but again, if you're running to some issues with being able to get into the field, which so far doesn't seem to be as much of a concern, priority should be made on those nitrogen and sulfur applications. Now, I talked about this a little bit in, in one of the scenarios that we're working with this year, uh, which is plant growth regulators. So 2019 was definitely not a PGR year. However, we are definitely we're in a completely different year on a, and, and working with a completely different crop. And so growth regulators might be a good fit on your operation this year. If you have early planted wheat that has lots of growth, uh, you have a variety that's prone to lodging, you may have a, a field that has history of manure applications or you're, you're using an intensive wheat uh, management program, then a PGR might be, might be uh, something that you try this year. And so the, um, the, main, the main plant growth regulators that are available in Ontario right now are Ethrol, Manipulator and ProLiant. Uh, ProLiant is, a, is actually something that uh, encourages growth, so we want to only apply that in the fall up to growth stage 30. Ethrol has been around for a couple of years, uh, but it has such a tight window of application, it's really important to get the timing just right. Uh, so I do anticipate uh, growers trying Manipulator this year. The ideal stage for that is growth stage 30 to 32. And MODIS, unfortunately, is not yet available in Ontario for, for 2020. However, I would encourage you to continue to watch for the results uh, on that growth regulator. Um, and it does have the same application window as, as uh, manipulator. Now, I guess there are a couple things that we just want to make you aware of um, in terms of the use of 
of plant growth regulators. And the first is that, you know, on really highly susceptible crops where you have lots of lodging, um, it doesn't necessarily completely eliminate the lodging in those scenarios. It might lessen it and, and de or delay it. And if you don't have lodging, PGRs are not a tool necessarily to just give you yield or increase yield. In fact, they've had variable effects on yield where there hasn't been lodging. So you might see an increase in yield, you might see a decrease in yield or, or no impact on yield. So it's really important to understand that this is a tool to manage lodging. Uh, there has been some reports of instances where plants have stayed green longer and there's been some late unproductive tillers. Um, and again, this isn't going to happen on every acre or every year. It's just to, to make you aware that there are some effects out there that have been reported. There has been some work happening in Ontario, uh, thanks to Peter um, and Shane. And Alberta has also done a significant amount of work in this area. And in their results, they have seen that the most consistent response to plant growth regulators has really been a reduction in height. Um, and, and they really emphasize the need to test these products on multiple cultivars. So if you're growing multiple cultivars on field, I would encourage you to test it on the different cultivars. And, and just because you get a response with one variety doesn't necessarily mean, mean you'll get the same in another. So I would definitely encourage you to try that out. And we are looking to launch a project this year with Dr. Dave Hooker that'll include both small and large scale test plots. And we do have a protocol available. So if you are interested in participating, you can contact us and let us know. Or, alternat or alternatively, you can check out fieldcropnews.com. And on there, there is a plant growth regulator article. And at the very bottom of that, uh, you can find a link to the protocol if you're interested in participating. And so with that, if you have any questions, you can definitely reach out to me by email or by phone. Um, I'm trying to get better on Twitter, so you can also shoot me a message on there. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing us try and beat the provincial yield record again in 2020. And hopefully we'll make this one of the most profitable crops uh, for Ontario producers in 2020. So with that, uh, good luck. Awesome. Thank you, Joanna, for that. Uh, that was really insightful. We do have a question. Um, so in order to maximize nutrient use, and reduce the loss of nutrients. Can growers consider the use of nitrogen stabilizers? If so, when should they apply and split them in an application program? Yeah, so this is a great question. Um, at this time of year, when temperatures are generally still pretty cool, uh, this year in particular, soils aren't extremely saturated. Uh, we aren't seeing or don't anticipate there to be a lot of nitrogen losses due to things like denitrification. Um, and so Ontario research has shown that in the first application, products like ESN have, have shown no yield advantage, um, but have provided a boost in protein and agrotain plus, uh, especially if those uh, nitrogen applications are delayed, uh, they've actually decreased yield. So we need to be careful with where we're using those. Um, if you're concerned, you know, temperatures get fairly warm, uh, you know, later on, later on, a product such as Entrench might be something to consider in those in those later applications. Um, but uh, based on the current research that exists in Ontario, uh, we don't find there to be um, benefits, especially uh, in a year like this where we don't have extremely saturated soils or or very warm temperatures right now when that nitrogen is being applied. Awesome, thank you. Um, any other questions? What is the yield prediction for this year? Good question. <laughs> um, no, I would say that, uh, you know, I, I don't really like to make yield predictions because I haven't been in every portion of the province to, to do stand counts and, and such at this point. But I would definitely say that our yield potential is much higher this year compared to 2019. The crop was planted earlier and in much better conditions. We had a lot, lot more fall growth, and we've also had a much better start to the spring compared to 2019. So in 2019 at this time, 
it was still very cool. I, I believe we still had a snowfall around this point last year and then things stayed relatively wet. So we did have fields, uh, you know, that were just sitting underwater for significant portions of the time of time. So we, we saw a lot of, of, of stand loss. Whereas this year stands are nice and even they emerge nice and evenly and growers are already getting out uh, their, their early uh, single app or their early split applications. And so I do think that our yield potential is definitely higher this year. And uh, hopefully we can do everything we can in our power uh, to maximize that potential. Okay, so I think that's it for questions. Thank you, Joanna. This is great information for 